team. This is a meeting of the Northampton Public Works Committee uh, Commission. Not committee, commission. <laughs> it's uh, Wednesday, February 10th, 530 in the evening. Uh, we normally take public comment first, but there are no members from the public here, so we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is approval of the minutes of the January 13th, 2016 Public Works Commission meeting. Move approval. Second. Any comments? I offered a couple to BJ, but they were not of substance. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Extensions? Passes. Um, I should comment that the meeting's being recorded by Northampton Community Television for your viewing pleasure. Um, we have an item under new business. It's very exciting. It is to set date for hearing to view and discuss the private way status of Bottoms Road. Um, I understand that this has been referred to us by the City Council. It has been. Um, I did a little bit of research. Um, no deliberation tonight. We really just need to set the date. Um, but um, the board had previously recommended um, Bottoms Road become a public way. Um, department staff had worked on a survey plan um, regarding the limits as described and approved by the board. It went in front of the city council and um, did not approve, to the city council did not approve Bottoms Road becoming a public way. So it appears that um, there's been a petition filed with the city council for reconsideration of their previous vote. So I went back um, and I just because of the change from the board to the commission, I looked at the uh, at the ordinance, and it looks like the process is the same for the commission. That we need to have a public hearing um, out at the street to meet people there and, and to walk the uh, to walk the private way and gather information, and then come back to a meeting and deliberate on um, what you believe um, is the appropriate uh, vote there, about whether that should be a public way or remain a, pri remain a private way. So that's sort of the background. Um, I found the file. There's a great number of certified mails that need to go out and a lot of sort of administrative time in order to get a public hearing set up. So um, we should probably look at um, a couple weeks out for potential meeting times. Um, it's really at your convenience whether we, some of these have been done in the evening, some of them have been done on the Saturdays. Um, so it's really up to you in terms of what you what you prefer. Can we do them uh, the Wednesday before the meeting? We could do that. Sure. sure. On March 9th? I won't be around um, the 9th and the 16th of March. So we might as well talk about the next board meeting at the same time. That will give us a little bit more light in the evening. So we're talking about April then? Uh, or we're going to go out to twenty third, May twenty third of March. March. Are we going to have what, a what time commission are you meeting? About? Are we going to have a commission meeting at the same time? Um, I was thinking that we could meet on the twenty third of March of March for our regular commission meeting. Okay. Okay. So we would start here at, at five. Well, we we meet on site at five thirty yeah. or something, and then come here, or we would meet there at five. And then we'd meet there at five. Okay. I think I have and hours enough time since yeah, we've done this so. one. Yeah. This will be our third time out there. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, have there been changes, or we don't know that yet? Um, I I do want to after we set after the date okay. talk about that because okay. I was confused about the drawing that was included. So five p.m. on April twenty third. March 23rd. March 23rd. March 23rd. It's a Wednesday. Yeah. All right, I'll send out letters, certified letters this week, and I'll send you a notice that it's a hearing, and I'll tell you where. I pulled out the old hearing, and it's on the corner of Bottoms and... Clement Street. Yeah, yes. we, we were looking yeah. at that. So it'll say that in the hearing notice. So, Jim, I noticed... On the, the map with the plan attached to the petition that they, the last time I recall talking about this, there was an issue of 
where the the jut out occurs for the city vehicles to turn around because right. we're not going all the way to the end of the end house right. and um, it was on the property of I think Kosinowitz and they objected to it and, I, and then I thought that subsequent to that that there was a further discussion that, that put the turnaround on a different property that was acceptable to everybody that's true it, so it, there was a plan that was more up-to-date than the one that was attached to the petition. Okay. The one that was attached to the petition had this sort of sketch of a little square that was sooner, that the turnaround was closer to Clement Street. And that was the plan, the final plan that was drafted and moved to the council. Um, so, okay. And there's, Ned was actually quite good. There was a, a whole raft of email in there. Um, the board had discussed it and then he went back and got concurrence from people that lived along the street. He was making sure everybody was happy because everybody was in here, as some of the board members remember, um, with concerns about it. So there was agreement in the location of the end. So this is not, does this reflect that or it's what you sent us? This, the, the email that the petitioners said referenced option four, which is this one. Mm -hmm. Not that's a little five there, a little four there, but so it's, that's the one that was drafted up. So does this mean they would, they're not asking to continue to, right. are we currently maintaining this road all the way to the end? Or we are we currently plowing it still. To, to, to the end, end. All the way to the end. And they don't want that. At the end. Uh, no, okay. uh, our our position was that it was inappropriate to um, go all the way to the house at the end. That we that our obligation as a public way should just be to go to where the last property connects to the road. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we I think it was at our our board's request that we pulled it back down the road. So I'm just trying to clarify the actual practice versus the. That what will right. be, what the practice will change. Be one, less than what we Less than what we do now. Okay. Yes. Yeah. This this road is really difficult to do. David? Did the planning board become involved in this question back then? I the planning apparently board apparently they did. The planning board um, well they have a role but they their vote at that time was no recommendation, so they didn't apparently they didn't uh, take a position one way or another. Although I think some members of the planning board have very strong feelings about it um, not becoming a public street. Um, so this needs to go back to them. I talked to uh, someone in the planning office today and they're, they're going to go back and deliberate about the things that they were concerned about. And when we deliberate, I can let you know what those are. Why is it coming back to us? Because um, the council rejected it? Is that what someone said earlier? So it's a new petition. So we need to take new action, go through the process again. That, that was what I was hearing from I don't, you this right. I don't know why. I asked Pam Powers, the council clerk, why it wasn't approved. Um, and she sent me an email. She said at the first reading, there was no one there to speak to the order. So the council went forward based on the feedback from the planning board, which doesn't exactly jive with what I had heard from Carolyn Mish. And then she says, although the DPW recommendation was available and considered, the understanding about why the planning board made their recommendation swayed the council. So I think they took a vote of no recommendation, but there might have been there might have been board members there that had their own opinion. That's what I'm guessing. So there, there might have been some input provided to the council other than just the simple yes and no recommendation. Um, at the exact time that this order was being read and discussed, both the mayor and Ned were distracted with the black boxes on Main Street. It was the pinhole camera, shut down Main Street thing. Um, so they weren't around when this came up on the council agenda. Planning board gave more feedback at the second reading that supported their position. She says, I don't recall that there were any residents from the street at either time the votes were taken. Since the votes and some residents have continued discussions, um, City Council reconsider the petition, but in, in order for that to happen, the process needs to start over again as if we received it for the first time. So it sounds like they were hearing a lot from different people on the planning board with concerns about it becoming a public way, and um, they didn't necessarily hear anything specifically from Ned other than the fact that the, the full board had recommended that it become a, a public way to the limits that we had worked out. 
So we'll do the site hearing, but we won't act when we come back here, or we will. Well, I was going to bring that up. I we do need to act at a at a formal meeting of right. this commission, and and um, it seems to me that we could act that evening. Well, I, um, that will probably be my last meeting, <laughs> and I would want I would want all our ducks in order. I would want a report from the planning or, or have Carolyn at the meeting. I I just feel like there's just revealing too many open-ended questions about the procedure here and um, you know uh, I would need that to, to vote on. Well let me know what you need. The procedure is pretty clear. The the thoughts that Carolyn has is, as a planning person at the city she sent me a very long email today that was very detailed um, and I will share that information with you. It was very thought out about what their concerns are. The, the way they were viewing it was a little bit different than the way the board was re um, reviewing it and considering it last time. So um, I think on some of these ones that were very tricky, we tried to get input from Wayne or Carolyn to sort of add it to the mix so we could do that on this one. Well, what is the role of the planning board? To make a recommendation to the council. Okay. And so that this, sub you know, concurrent with our getting this, they got, they got this as well. Right. Okay. And does it, it's parallel. It yes. doesn't feed into yes. our process right. necessarily. Right. Do we want to know what they're what they're well, thinking? The the one the observation, stuff. the recollection I have is that we dealt with many of these, forty or fifty of these, right. and in most cases the planning board uh, had established no opinion, mm -hmm. and so we developed the practice of just doing it on our own. Mm -hmm. um, this this one was one of the few where they they have an opinion. This this the way I remember. I think they felt a lot of them were political and just sort of a political decision and not, I think they were unsure about what criteria to make a decision. I mean, it was the same thing that the board had struggled with, what criteria, but rather than trying to make a recommendation, I think on a lot of them, like you said, like they just didn't. They're not required to hold a public hearing, though. No. So it's really, they're just offering whatever it's, it's yeah basically it's a yes or a no recommendation based on their own criteria so following up I asked in an email do we have policy about what we uh, most towns I've worked in really tiny ones have even gone and done that I mean you're smiling at me like mm. do oh, we have because oh. we struggled and struggled and struggled well, and, and Mike came up with a wonderful um, uh, uh, matrix. Thank you. And but even even so, with all the data points and, and very, I mean, it was a good a good uh, matrix. And and mostly we used them. And mostly we found if they were something that was similar, that we, we would use that as a criteria. But it was hard. So we don't. So we do or do not have an official no. policy. No, no, there's no official well, policy. We, we could not. We could not without contradicting ourselves and without contradicting. Yeah, yeah. and the, I, the way I remember it going was, as as we got close to establishing a policy, uh, the reality was we we're going to exclude too many small streets that had received city services that would no longer receive them, and the abutters would be required to take care of themselves. Well, can't you grandfather? I mean, I think that's how some communities have well, dealt with these things. So, so in effect, I guess you would say they got grandfathered in. The, for a new street, there are very definite requirements for becoming a public way. So and which we tried to consider. We tried to consider. Okay, so this all just, came up because we'd been maintaining private ways. That, that's right. David, you've been something like that? I think, you know, one of, one of these uh, issues, the, the, the phrase backyard subdivision was <laughs> brought into the picture probably by the planning board. And I thought that was an issue here of creating 800 or some, you know, a significant distance of city road mm -hmm. without any plans or provisions for utilities or anything. Uh, and I, I also think that that the residents who lived at the distant house that would benefit from a back from a, a subdivision approval didn't want it. They wanted sure. to keep their open space. Mm -hmm. uh, 
But I and I don't remember which part, which uh, street it was the one that this term came to end of the picture. But that was a concern multiple times. Was as it, would there be the opportunity to develop more land as a result of mm -hmm. creating a public way? In most cases, the answer was no. But, yeah. um, it does, although by bringing the endpoint back, we reduce that. Right, right. <laughs> We're talking about weeks and weeks and weeks and years. Yeah. So we did yeah. due yeah. diligence yeah. to the fourth degree. Mm -hmm. okay. Didn't we also yeah. conclude that we would uh, ultimately, even though the uh, the dollar amount would be meaningless, that we would add to our inventory of streets and so the uh, chapter, chapter 90, 90, 90 funds yeah. would go up. Yeah, yeah. 60 feet. That ultimately <laughs> was a, a net no, it's well, a benefit. Of, lots of road. It's a road, right. You're right. Without really adding much cost. Yeah. Because yeah. we're already doing service that we were Supposing not to do it. We've been doing it for how long have we been cars? <laughs> a long time. Anything else on the side? So the so the letter will say that we're doing the site visit, following up with coming returning here to have agendas. a meeting to make the decision yeah. so that everybody hearing, yeah. all the abutters will know that. Yeah. We'll send something out. Okay, thanks. Is this the last of the... Uh, yes, the last. Well, well congratulations. Wow. <laughs> We've had a lot of laughs. <laughs> okay. And that's what's so humorous about this. Group. Oh, no. It's that? right. It yeah. We tabled it for many, 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 many years. years. <laughs> and, then, and then every Saturday we were up here. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay, moving on on the agenda. Under old business, uh, water and sewer rate study. Um, the mayor commissioned a consultant to evaluate or look at uh, alternative ways to set water and sewer rates in the city, and Jim forwarded to us the consultant's presentation and also a link to the uh, city council meeting where they made a presentation. And. Uh, I believe Jim is fully prepared to uh, explain this to us. Yes, I am. <laughs> You're in luck. Um, as Mike had indicated, the mayor's office did commission a study with um, Raffalus Consulting and Woodcock and Associates um, to look at uh, various options for water and sewer rates. Um, the project's been going on for a few months. Um, the slides that you have were from a presentation that was made to the City Council on January 21st, and there was a link to the video of that if you were interested in looking at what um, the consultants had to say about the work. I thought what I would do is just um, walk through um, some of the slides and the more salient points that were made um, in the study and some of the conclusions that came out of it. Um, Raffalus and Woodcock have a lot of experience in, in doing studies like this, so we were happy with the, um, the depth of experience of the individuals working on the project, and they clearly uh, had great depth of knowledge about um, different options for water and sewer rates. Um, DPW worked with Susan Wright, the finance director, and the mayor. Um, we had a kickoff meeting with them, with the consultants, and then we um, provided a lot of uh, information about our billing system, our current billing system, to the consultant. So uh, Anne Marie provided information, and Ned um, provided a lot of information about, about our system and our customer database. Um, Ned provided a lot of information about our capital programs that are planned on the water and sewer side. And the consultant used all that um, to build a rate model for the city based on all of that information. We had, um, and at the top, top of the second page, um, we had a kickoff meeting that was sort of a brainstorming session about the objectives of the study and, and what some of the goals were. 
And the four bullets here that, that are shown on the slide were some of the things that the mayor's office was interested in, promoting water conservation, um, providing assistance to economically disadvantaged customers, um, improving equity among customer types, and enhancing revenue stability. So looking at different rate structures within our financial needs that would meet um, some or all of those objectives. So they, uh, as I just indicated, they work closely with us to build on um, this financial model based on operating expenses, the capital expenses, um, and looked at um, so look, look at revenues and expenses basically and, and different ways of um, meeting the revenue needs with, with different rate structures. Um, and they included three sort of graphs from the uh, information from the, the financial model that they put together. And the city council didn't really go into a lot of detail about these and I'm not really prepared to go into a lot of detail about these either, other than um, suffice to say that um, as, the, as the commission is aware, there are a lot of uh, wastewater projects coming out of the Comprehensive Wastewater Management Plan um, that are really, I think, maybe one of the primary reasons to look at the rate structure because of these large capital projects that are coming and looking at ways to, um, to fund those. So they did look at um, the annual capital needs and then they developed this overall financial plan that looked at operating expense, debt service, um, and then capital that we have in reserve that we use for projects. So looking at that in the ways that the board had done in the past in terms of financing the things that we need to finance. So there were financial plans in the water and sewer side put together. And then um, Chris Woodcock spent some time with the council just sort of explaining and reviewing what the current water rate structure is. Um, figuring that most of the council uh, may not have been aware of the details of how we go um, for water and sewer right now. So uh, the next three slides talk about our current water rate structure. Um, all of our customers, we have, we have the same, we use the same rate for everybody right now. Um, regardless of the type or size and the amount of water they use, it's basically a flat rate based on usage. We have a very small fixed rate uh, charge that's charged for based on meter size. So if you look at your um, water bill at home, you most likely have a $1 or $1.25 um, charge on your bill for based on water meter size. And right now we have no, no fire protection charges. There are a lot of communities that will charge um, a premium for providing fire protection to a building. So um, having um, the ability to have adequate water that would serve to uh, serve a commercial sprinkler system. Many communities charge for that service. It's something that we haven't done. So right now there's no fire protection charge. So the next slide on the, the upper right hand side just shows our, our current rate structure in FY16. Um, $5.58 per 100 cubic feet. Um, is, is what the rate is for everybody, as I, I, I indicated. And then the fixed charge for the meter is also listed in the table there, so a 5 eighths inch meter has a dollar. Um, those are quarterly um, charges that, uh, that are shown there. So very small fixed fee and single uh, volumetric rate for all our customers. Our current sewer rate structure um, is very simple. All the customers are charged for a sewer based on 100% of their metered water use. So there's no adjustment made. Um, we have, I think there are five, this is a small number of large industrial customers. I think we have five that have separate sewer meters. So these are um, commercial uh, or industrial customers that use water in some process in a way that it reduces their discharge significantly to the sewer and they had asked the city at one point or another to install a sewer meter and we have five of those. Um, but everybody else is just charged on 100% basis of what, what your water use is, turns out to be what your sewer bill is based on. So the next series of slides talks about preliminary rates and this is, I guess, sort of getting to the heart of um, the analysis that um, Woodcock and Raffalus did. Um, we had some overview 
um, an analysis of options that are listed here. Seasonal rates, tiered water rates, fixed charges, second meter policies, sewer rate setting method methodologies, and private fire protection charges. So I'll talk about these a little bit. Um, we didn't get anything in writing about these. We discussed them in meetings, and um, some things were ruled out just based on that discussion. Um, the concept behind seasonal water rates is that they're um, they're intended to help drive water con water conservation in the summer months. So in the in the winter, your water use is slow. In the summertime, water use goes up um, quite a bit because of um, what's the non-essential water use for things like filling your pool or washing your car, that sort of thing. Um, regulatory authorities sometimes are encouraging communities to do uh, water conservation seasonal rates. Um, I think one of the problems that Chris Woodcock had with these is that um, he felt that they were somewhat problematic to implement um, because we have a quarterly billing system and not a monthly system. So because there are different, there's different time frames when people are getting billed, um, he said it makes it very difficult. He said seasonal rates in other parts of the country um, are more commonly used because um, they, and they talked about the mid-Atlantic states where um, one of the consultants had done a lot of work down there where um, their water bills are monthly. So doing a seasonal rate based on changing what the rate is in the, in the summer months is something that's fairly easy to implement. So we didn't really explore that any further other than, other than to have a, um, a, a, a just a discussion about it really. Um, when we talked about uh, tiered water rates, and that this was something that we ended up following up on, but um, the tiers are basically um, established so that the more water you use, the more, that, more the more you pay. Sort of the basic concept there. Um, and there's a lot of details and the in analysis that goes into determining how best to set the rates, um, and what are the what are the considerations that you might use to set the rates to make sure that. If you're establishing tiers, that you're still being fair to people, and that you're not that there's that you're not penalizing any one class of water user because they use a lot of water or whatever the circumstance is. So, when you implement tiers, um, care has to be taken to make sure that you're not on this, you're you're being fair and you're not penalizing any class of water user. Um, fixed charges is is something else that uh, came out into the recommendation and. The concept there is that when you when you own and operate a water system, um, the vast majority of your costs are fixed. But right now, the, um, we only we only gather I think about a half a percent of our revenue is based on fixed charges on those meters. So um, the consultant felt like it made more sense to try to increase the amount of revenue from a fixed charge versus a charge that was based on the amount of water that was used. Um, and that, the overall effect there, um, or the intent of the effect is to sort of stabilize your revenues, although I think our revenue, we've been pretty good in, we've been pretty good at tracking what, and projecting what our revenues are going to be, but as you implement water conservation efforts, your water use goes down and that can impact your, that can impact your revenue. So the idea is to have some higher percentage of fixed charge so that you're going to get that revenue regardless of the amount of water that's used. Mm -hmm. It makes pretty good sense, I think, you know, it makes sense. So that that's something that was carried forward. Um, second meter policies we discussed, and that's essentially the concept of um, having second meters basically for irrigation for people that want to have uh, water use for irrigation, water that ends up not going down the sewer, seeking relief on their, um, on their sewer bill. Um, there was some reasons mainly related to additional billing cost and administrative effort um, with managing second meters, why this was, um, this ended up being discarded as um, an option moving forward. Um, there was also a sense that there's an increased cost to, to install the meter, there's backflow prevention that's necessary on irrigation, so there'd be additional costs for homeowners on backflow prevention devices and inspection and other, and other costs. So because of difficulty in, in administration, that was not carried forward. But the, the next item that was considered, which was sewer rate setting methodologies, was explored as an alternative to second uh, meters. And that is essentially 
establishing a, a way or a way of um, changing the basis for billing on sewer. So right now it's a 100% basis. All your water, all the water that you use, you get billed on the sewer side for. And one way of changing that is to say, um, estimate, say that 80% of the water that comes into a household actually goes down, uh, ends up going down in the sewer and, and requiring treatment. So the concept there is to apply a percentage to your water use and bill your sewer rate, your, your sewer based on that amount. Um, and that was something that was um, was moved forward, and I think um, that addresses some concerns that we've had from residents. I think that have asked questions about irrigation water use and um, <coughs> the feeling that you know a lot of times people are using water in the warm months that doesn't go down the sewer and they don't like being billed for it. So the 80% basis is a way I think of trying to address some of those concerns. Jim, yeah, there was a, there was another issue in that the five industrial users with sewer meters uh, only pay for the water that goes to the sewer um, as a sewer charge, whereas all the other users in the city um, were paying their sewer bill based on all the water that went into their house. Mm -hmm. So there was a desire to make that on a more common basis. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. It's. Um it's really an equity issue because dollar, you know, gallon for gallon that goes into the sewer for these large users is based on their sewer meter. But for you and I, we're paying 100%, although some lesser portions going in. So it increases equity in the overall sewer billing in the system. So that was a um, an important part of of that discussion. Um, the last option that was uh, discussed or analyzed was the concept of fire protection charges, and these are. These are fixed fees to account for the fact that the way that we develop uh, and build and maintain our water system is basically predicated, a lot of it's predicated on providing adequate fire protection. Um, when we had the water asset management meeting at JFK a little while ago, Tate and Howard had described their model that they had developed in the city's water system and how we go about deciding which water mains are the ones that are higher priority than others in prioritization a lot of those priorities are determined and sizes are determined based on fire protection needs. So the concept of a charge for fire protection really gets at the heart of the way that you run your system. So it makes a lot of sense and I think it, um, it goes hand in hand with the way a water, um, a public water supplier runs their system and decides how they want to spend money. Um, and ultimately some of your larger expenses like storage and pipe sizes, those those are all increased for fire protection reasons, so you have an increased cost of capital to build a system to maintain it for fire protection. So a fixed charge is one way of, of getting at those increased costs that are provided for that reason. So that, um, that concept of fire protection charge was carried forward. Before we, are you done with this sure. slide? Uh, before we went on to the next slide, I was, I had a question. I understood him to say that the fixed charges that we charge, or a dollar or whatever, doesn't really cover our fixed char charges. Right. Yeah, so I thought that was significant. Right. I don't know where our, our fixed charges came from on the meter charge, but um, they, they did describe that only about a half a percent of our revenue comes in from these fixed charges and that when you look at the value, it's a dollar. So like on my, on my bill, my water bill, it's a dollar. It's not enough for us to send someone to take the meter reading and come and download it and have the clerk to build the bill and mail it. I mean, even just the cost of the stamp pretty much covers that. So it doesn't come anywhere near um, covering even the cost of sending the bill out, never mind the overall fixed cost associated with owning and operating and running the system. My guess is the fixed charges were established a while ago based on just the cost of the meter itself. Mm -hmm. You know, knowing that it has a certain life and you trying to recoup that. I don't think it was ever really intended to cover other fixed charges in the system. No, probably not. We might not have understood the concept of what those fixed right. charges would right. cover. Right. Yeah, that would be interesting. Can I ask a question about the fire protection? Mm -hmm. Are you talking about um, sprinklers, or are you also talking about the hydrant system? Um, fire lines into, into buildings, so commercial sprinklers. buildings that are required to have. Yeah. And residential fire sprinklers? Um, those will not, those will receive a charge. 
and uh, I'll talk about that in a little bit. But you're right in general about hydrants. Obviously, that's a key component of fire protection for everybody in the city, whether it's a commercial building or not. Mm -hmm. And that and that also does get to the cost, you know, the cost of building the system large enough to handle the, the fire flow. Okay. Where there is no water line, public water line, there is no fire hydrants. Which gets to the no charge for um, for some of these sprinkler systems, but I'll I'll talk about that. So or just to make sure I captured what you've said so far, off the table seasonal rates and second meter policies. Everything else is still up for discussion. Right. Okay. Yep. So after after we had the discussion about those options, um, they started to look in more detail at the financial model and the revenue needs of the city. And they came up with um, the information that's summarized in the next slide, which is the preliminary water rate structure. Um, they looked at different ways of creating tiers, and what they came up with was a proposal to create two separate uh, volumetric rates based on meter size. So your smaller meters, five eighths inch, three quarter inch, and one inch are basically your residential home small user uh, meters. And then uh, larger meters, an inch and a half or greater, would have a separate volumetric rate. And then for those in that small, in the small customer rate, there'd be two tiers that would be put in in place there. And um, I'll talk about that in a minute. But the two tiers for smaller customers were based on the idea of um, water conservation in trying to um, promote that. So that would essentially occur by providing um, a reduced water rate uh, for lower quantity water users. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then the, the idea of covering a greater amount of the fixed cost through larger quarterly fixed fees um, basically gets at that, that low meter charge and in increasing those to increase the revenue that comes from the fixed charge and then implementing um, these fire protection charges as I talked about. So the slide on the bottom of this page, the bottom left, is the preliminary water rate structure which gets to their, more specifically, their recommendations for these changes and how we build. So as you look at this table proposed for FY 17, um, where it says volumetric small users, um, this is where for small residential, for residential users, there's, there are two tiers that are proposed. Um, one, one water rate uh, in tier one of $4.73 per 100 cubic feet, and then one uh, for everything over 16 CCF that goes up to $6.21. 6 um, the break point there of 16 CCF, um, it says on the bottom of the table there, that's about 12,000 gallons a quarter, about 135 gallons a day. And how they arrived at that number is it's based on um, a state goal for per capita water use of 65 gallons per person per day, times the average household size in Northampton, which is about 2.07, that's what gets you the 135 gallons per day. So it's the basis there. So if you use very little water up to that state, the state says, you know, you should be able to live just fine on 65 gallons a person a day without a lot of hardship. So if you can live by that state standard, um, you're going to be billed at a lower rate at $4.73. So, but if you use more than that, every gallon, um, above the 16 CCF would be billed at the higher rate. So you build at the lower rate until you hit 16 and then you're billed at the higher rate um, for the amount of water that you use for the quarter. So those are for the, the small meter sizes that I had mentioned, the 5, five eighths through 1 inch. So as you go down the, the chart, for the larger volumetric users, these were uh, larger users, commercial users with um, meter size is an inch and a half or greater. There's a flat rate, $6.09 um, right now. Um, $6.09 is what's, is what's proposed. So it's a flat rate, and 
I think there was some consideration to tiering for commercial users, but it becomes a lot more difficult to determine with a commercial user what it, how do you determine non-essential water use for a commercial user in terms of how to break up that rate. So there's no clear way to break it up. I think they did look at um, the information that we had about larger water consumers to see if there was any way that, you know, sometimes you look at the data and something might just fall out, like, oh, well, that maybe that makes sense and you can think about it. But there wasn't anything, I think, in the data that Woodcock saw that um, indicated a, a break um, into tiers. So um, based on that, the concept is just a flat rate for larger water volume users, and clearly the more water you use, you, get, you, you pay more for it at that rate. The quarterly fixed charges um, were identified um, further in this table, and you can see that they varied. Uh, residential style meters, the smaller ones, $12.64 a quarter. A one inch meter is uh, $31.59. Um, these translate uh, totally into um, about 8%. 8 percent of the revenue needs of the department are about $500,000 a year, I guess, is what uh, Woodcock had estimated there. So right now, as I just indicated, these fixed, char the fixed charges generate about a half a percent of the revenue, or about 38000 So it's a pretty significant jump. But when um, Woodcock described this to the council, you know, $12 a quarter uh, for, your, for the city to generate a bill is not, you know, based on a monthly thing, it's like three and change a month. Um, it's still... Um, a pretty small amount um, from that standpoint for administrative charge. So those are the uh, those are the, the primary water rate structures. And then the next slide to the right of that um, identified a proposal for fire protection charges. So preliminary rates um, that were presented. Um, these were just preliminary. They weren't presented to the council as a proposal. It was more this is the status of the study and the preliminary findings. Um, so the the rates were determined here and, and as shown based on the fire line size into a building um, the quarterly rates would be as shown and they had estimated that um, that would generate about hundred thousand dollars on an annual basis and we had a little bit of discussion about lines less than two inches which basically there's only a small number of residential fire systems in the city and it was decided at this point not um, not to bill those uh, for that service because um, there's been some focus by the fire department in encouraging residential uh, sprinklers as an effective way of saving lives. Mm -hmm. So as a policy, it seemed to be a bad idea um, to, to charge people for something that the fire department is trying to encourage. Um, so that's what we left it. It was in there for discussion and also if the city ever decides to to assign a charge to that and we'll be in the system for them to do that. So on the next page, the sewer rate structure um, was recommended to revise the, the rate structure to base it on 80% of the needed water use. Um, and then based on their analysis, um, they came up with a preliminary sewer rate of $7.52 um, as shown in the table there on that slide. The next slide gets to the concept of an affordability program. This is something that the Board of Public Works I think had discussed but never in great detail and never decided to, uh, I think eventually probably the Board would have, have got there about um, affordability. But uh, the Mayor was, was concerned about increasing costs to city residents and we had um, quite a bit of discussion about affordability and what was decided was that it would make sense for customers that are already eligible for financial relief from the city on taxes whether it's real estate or CPA tax taxes exemptions would become eligible for exempt exemption from the quarterly fixed charge so they'd still be based for their water usage but the fixed charge would be um, would be waived, and um, and that makes sense I think because the fixed charge by reducing it to zero, they only get billed based on the consumption, and consumption is something that people can control if they're careful in the way they do it. So it provides some 
ability to control your bill. Um, and these exemptions are consistent with what we do with the stormwater utility program right now, as you, as you know. So I think it adds consistency to decisions that we made with the stormwater utility with the, with water and sewer. Um, so I think that's a, uh, a very good decision to move ahead with the affordability programs for people. So the next few slides um, show their analysis on customer impacts. And the first slide at the bottom right hand page is uh, water, shows what the water only customer impacts are. So you can see based on water usage, they have one, one particular um, usage identified here as sort of the median or typical customer 12 CCF per quarter, it's about 9,000 gallons. But as you work away across in that highlighted column, you'll see that current bill based on this usage is about $68 a quarter. And based on the changes um, that were described here, the, their preliminary estimate of the bill would be $69.40, or a $1.44 um, increase in the bill on, based on a quarterly charge. And then the next two columns to the right show what the reduction in bill would be um, for people that are eligible for the affordability programs that I just talked about. So they would see a, a reduction, um, you know, a reduction accordingly based on the fixed fee that was deleted from their bill. So <clears throat> the real small users would be m more penalized than or see higher charges. The, the, the below, above the green line there. Right. That's right. You do use the word green line. But they can conserve. The, the advantage is they can conserve and that fee would be adjusted. Right. But they've already conserved by using so little. I mean, isn't that a reflection of the usage on the four, yeah. far left yeah. column? I think I think what happens is the fixed charge right. becomes a very predominant piece right. of their bill, right. whereas as you go down the chart, it's smaller. Right. And that is a percentage. Right. That's exactly right. So the fixed charge, because it increases, um, ends up having a larger impact right. on, on those on that end of the scale. <coughs> do they do they like crunch the numbers in terms of Northampton and come out with scenario? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They crunch. And it so you've got percentages of how many people would be impacted. Right. Right. It's interesting to look at because some of those really small water users, I don't think there's that many. Mm -hmm. like, I don't know. I don't think there was really that many that are on that very low, the low three. end. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they did. They were able to look at that, and that's how they determined the median was about 12, because they, they looked at the statistics of that. You know, it's kind of interesting. I think the having having a a billing charge every month is consistent with other utilities, your electric bill, or your gas bill. Right. I always um, am pained a little bit by my gas bill because I have I have a gas stove at home, but I don't heat with gas. So when I get my bill. The vast majority of my bill is just for the fact that they give me gas, and then my usage is like pennies every month, and I pay like 10 or 12 bucks just because I can get gas. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, this the concept is similar here, that um, there's a fixed charge that people would have to pay. I, I think people living on their own, one person in the household would be at the, the three to six room. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, I was thinking of them too. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So yeah, there's definitely a bit of a change. I think the uh, I do like the tiers. Yeah, I mean, I do like the tier system, and I like the affordability program because the for people that are really having a hard time, um, that fixed charge will go away. So this increase that you see, mm -hmm. if there's a problem paying it, uh, ultimately they may not have to pay it because they can get an exemption from it. So um, I think the combination of the two is is a pretty good policy, um, but. It would be a change for people. So at the top of the next page, the slide up on the upper left shows a, um, a comparable slide for sewer, um, what the sewer bills would be. And again, um, the highlighted column there is for the median user. And the bill currently would be about $72.96. And the proposed bill would be $72.19 or a change a reduction of about 77 cents a quarter. So, not a lot. Everything's pretty. Con everything's pretty consistent. I think with, um, 
you know, when you look at the residential range, the lower range of, uh, of sewer use. And then the, the table to the right just takes the previous two tables and combines them into the total bill so you can see what, um, what the total bill would look like, which is what people would uh, see when they get the new bills based on the changes in the rates. So the, the summary uh, of the study and the presentation that the consultants had made to the City Council was um, things that we've been just talking about, um, providing um, rate relief to people based on, on income criteria, using already established criteria that the City has for taxes, creating a two-tier water rate structure for small meters for residential users, um, implementing um, uh, an increase in the fixed charges based on water meters, um, creating a new fire protection charge based on uh, fire line size, and then billing sewer rate at 80% of the metered water use. Um, so those are pretty much the, the recommendations that came out and the ones that worked out in the model that um, seemed to meet the objectives of the study and the direction that the mayor wanted to head in. So and there was a, a next step slide here. So the mayor is working with the consultant to finalize the study um, and will be working on his formal recommendation of rates to the City Council, which I think will look very much like, anticipating that they'll look very much like the ones that are in the presentation, although um, he's still um, sort of fact-checking capital programs and some other things to see if these will be revised and all. So, um, so he's working on some of those things with us. Um, and then, so they're going to, they're saying here, assist city with finalizing and implementing rates. So that's finalizing the rate model and making sure that things are checked. And then um, assist the city with customer outreach and education on new rates. One of the things that the mayor was interested in doing was putting a little, a little tool on the on the, the rate website, so that you could enter, you could take your bill into your water usage and see what your current bill was and what the future bill would be based on the new rates. It's kind of a nice thing and I think it's not that difficult to do so he was asking uh, the consultant to, to help us get something up on the website and I think he's probably, that'll happen I think probably pretty quickly. Um, so that's sort of the summary of, of the study and the things that came out of it. Um, I'm happy to try to answer any questions. I do have Anne Marie here because I, I, I'm, I'm good when I'm, I'm good when speaking from the notes. But uh, any questions that we can try to answer, I'd be happy to try to do that. Gary. Well, I think the biggest one for me, it, it looks like the rates will actually be easy to pass in terms of the public. I mean, it looks like most people are going to see some kind of discount, or at least not a huge increase. Um, but I'm wondering about, so what does it mean? I, when I see, you know, going back to the capital improvements plan, water financial plan, and sewer financial plan, is it really going to do what it needs to do, and that is to support the future needs of infrastructure? And I, I think what this means is it does, but I don't I just want to hear you say it. It does. <laughs> <laughs> Am I right or wrong? I mean, they're very different. Two of them look really similar, and one of them looks out of, out of whack. And it, has to be with some big projects in 2019 that would be the you know, it's, it's, stuff. I think it's really great because we were able to provide the baseline for the study was to take the capital projects from the comprehensive wastewater plan and we just gave them that plan and we said put these in the model and then see how you can work out the financing for the big projects and see what the impacts are. So they did that on the wastewater side, and then on the water side, I think for the next several years, we had identified capital projects that would need to happen in terms of water line replacement or dam repair, some of these other bigger projects that we have in mind, and those were all worked in to the model and to the rate study. So I think it was really encouraging that um, there was really nothing that caused us to have to go back and say, well, you know, those, this project and the 
that was recommended by Kleinfeld that can't be done at the wastewater plant or it needs to be delayed. It was pretty much it was taken and worked in and the rates were able to come out um, in a way that um, is fairly balanced I think over time. So um, the, you know, was, I think the rate increases were um, going to be fairly fairly modest. I think you said two and three percent. Right. Right around that. that right. Now. And then it was over. They, they talk that about that. The presentation. Right. Okay. Yeah. I'll say. I'll, I'll, I'll that, reaffirm that. That's two and three percent starting with the current rate. Right. Okay. And, and we've we've raised the rate to its current rate to support future projects. I mean, mostly that's what the conversation was always about. Why why do we want more money? Because we knew we had stuff coming up, and, right. and we didn't want to borrow everything. Right, and I think in the presentation there was some discussion about sort of the, the history of us developing some, some good reserves that help make that half not so steep mm -hmm. in terms of right. Have some capital. They, is that pay-go capital? Is that what they're calling? Where yeah. you, have some, you build up some capital, gives you some money to start design, and get you sort of on track, All right. keep you on track. Yeah, using the available That's money. Good. A um, couple things. One is, um, I'm not sure, I didn't watch the video, so um, is there, what kind of reaction was there from the council? Um, you know, I think, it was a, I think it was a lot for people to, um, to digest. There were a few questions that, um, that they answered. I, I think there were good thoughtful questions about, uh, one of them was about, um, you know, it's the old, it's the thing where you, you want people to conserve water, but sometimes it's the people with limited means that can't afford the low flush toilet and they can't afford to increase, you know, to, to, to change their plumbing fixtures and that sort of thing. I think Bill Dwight was asking this question where, you know, how these people are going to be penalized because they're going to pay more because they can't deal with their plumbing in a way that's going to allow them to be on the lower end of the water usage. So there was a lot of discussion about that, but one thing that didn't come out in that discussion was that we've been providing these water conservation kits to our residents at no cost. So for free they can come in and there's a way to modify your tank. If you have an old style toilet, you can modify the your tank so you use less water per flush. And then it has um, different adapters for your faucet and your shower so it reduces, you know, it gets those down to low flow. And it doesn't cost people anything to come in and get these things. So it's a program we've been proud of. I think we were really pushing it. I know we need to probably get the word out, but when we first started the program like three or four years ago, we had a lot of people come in and we were ordering boxes of these things and it's like a very low cost thing for us and um, it was very well received. And I think we still have information on our website that they're available, but we haven't had anything in the press recently about it, but it would make sense to try to get the word out on it. But that was one question. I think the consultant had a little bit of a hard time answering that one actually because they weren't sure what we were doing. Um, but not a lot of, I don't, do you remember any other questions, those of you that watched the video? I didn't make it all the way to the end yet. Yeah, it was pretty, it was, it was long. It was pretty long. <laughs> it was pretty long. But that, that was one of the main questions. Well, one of my concerns is, um, I don't, I do have a different philosophy about high industrial users and what they should pay. Right. So I don't know if that was, given the council makeup, whether that was part of the discussion. That discussion? I think it did come up. Um, there was, I think, Councillor O'Donnell had a little back and forth with Chris Woodcock about that, and um, you know, it still gets to the fact that you're billing, you're billing for a product and for for water, and there has to be some equity in the way that it's billed. Um, so you can't legally, obviously, penalize someone that's a large water user, even if you don't agree with the fact that they're. You know, a company like Coca-Cola is taking the water and they're putting it in a bottle, and you know, you may not agree with these things. And Chris clearly didn't in his response, but um, I think maybe the sense I got from the answer was that it was—it's legally difficult to just take one class of water user and, and charge them so much more than everybody else. Um, I don't—I don't really know what the. There was some back and forth on it, but uh -huh. I don't think there was necessarily any resolution about it. No, well, there wasn't. But it, if you look at the the impacts and the changes, they yeah. certain the impacts, the higher impacts fall to the larger users. On the... On both. If on you look at the combined, combined. Yeah. 
Well, it says no applicable. That's, oh, the, that's uh, the income discount. That's the income discount. So if you go to the okay, phone, I'm happy. Left. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you go, um, if you go to well, but that may be an issue why this may have trouble going forward. Is those users will speak up now, just like the low income users spoke up last year. Right. Uh, you know, it's a challenge to come up with a a plan that you know collects the revenue we need but keeps right. everybody happy. And there's intangibles in terms of economic development. There, there definitely are, um, and. You know, people have all, you have people have all, all kinds of opinions about about bottled water and things. But you know, my own opinion on some of it is that you know, Coca-Cola in this community, they're a large water user. A lot of our revenues come from from that company, and our ability to maintain the system and generate the revenues that we need. A lot of the money comes from them because they're a, you know they're a, such a significant user, and that allows us to maintain our system in a good way. And, and I also remember during the process of doing things, you negotiated with them to pay some extra right. costs. Right. And I was really impressed by that. Right. Um, I'd seen, I think, on the MMA, they're doing a, somebody's yeah, I, doing I sent a statewide I sent it to you. assessment of water, is it water yeah, or or just water water water. I Actually, maybe I sent it to everybody. Yeah, the MMA but article. I, but that was my question is, you know, mm -hmm. how, right. where do our water rates play out that was with our too. similar type communities and and other communities in the region? Yeah, did they do external uh, comparison, Scan, rate yeah. comparisons? No. Really? It'd be interesting. Well, that gets to the economic development issue. That's yeah, why it does. I, yeah, it does. I, that was my question. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the financial model was, was built on the city's needs. So regardless of what every other community in the universe is doing, um, it's based on the community needs for the system that the city has. Right, that's bottom line. But then also the issue of economic development, if our rates are lower for a high water user, industrial, um, that could make, maybe make a difference whether they are here in our industrial park or... Well, and I think they called out and they were calling out for municipal officials to participate in the survey. So that they can do the data collection. I'm the, sure they're going to do it. I think the problem with it is that um, when they do these, uh, sometimes when these these studies are done and they compare rates, it has to be apples to apples. Well, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the biggest problem. Right. Is you really need to drill down if you really want to know. You have to drill down and look at all the revenues that are coming in to any particular community and figure out where the money is coming from. Whether it, and and you'll see. Even with even with these changes, if you look at how, if these changes go through, where our revenue sources will come from for water under the new system versus the old one, where we're, we're going to have more fixed charges, are actually our water rate, the rate actually is going to go down. So if you look, if you throw us up on the chart with a bunch of other communities, mm -hmm. you can look, geez, and that the rate looks pretty low. It's good for Northampton. It's sort of like the tax rate and the values of the house. You know, that yeah. Yeah. kind of can't, yeah. that's apples and oranges. Yeah, but I do think that our water supply is one of our competitive advantages here in Northampton. I would say quality of water would, we have recent news about other. That's mm -hmm. been also mm -hmm. coming mm -hmm. up locally. Yeah. Uh, lead, what, the lead, we're going to have to answer that. That's a public question. Mm -hmm. Any more questions for joining us? Thank you for a very well explained and I think accessible thank you. presentation. Thank you. And shorter than the one on the left. <laughs> <laughs> that was long. That was very long. Shorter than what? Oh, the one with the city council is very long. Uh, an hour? An hour and a half. Well, they get health oh, insurance for that. <laughs> it was long. An hour and 20 minutes or so. It was pretty yeah. long. Yeah. Good. It's one of those things where you know a lot about a subject. And you ask a question. Yes. Oh, get, well, it they like drill down. It sounds like you may know Chris Woodcock, but Chris, yes. Chris is, uh, he's a really nice guy, and he's been doing this for a really long time. I worked with Chris a long time ago when I worked in Boston, and, and uh, he's just a super nice guy. But he's been doing it for so long. You ask him a question, and he can just. Uh, can tell you so <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't even know he was doing this. That's how long I've been out of touch. Yeah, he just keeps going on. And on, and on. Do we need to weigh in in any way? No. no. I don't think there's any. Master. This is for our information. Cool. Right. I don't think there's any motion that's necessary. Um, I think it's. 
my job just to make you aware of it and have this sort of consultation about it. I would say that had it been based on uh, capital expenditures that don't meet the department's needs, then we probably want to speak up. But by Gary, I was encouraged to see that it looks like it's addressing all of those. So um, I, I'm, I'm pleased with the way it's going. Mm -hmm. Well, it's better than that. It sounds like that was the starting point, that we, we already had all this information about what we thought our, our projected needs would be. We had all these great studies, and so it was pretty easy to just turn that over and start from there. So it does make sense that it would work. We should have at least one very difficult question for Anne Marie before she goes home. <laughs> it's okay. Well, oh, she's good. good. Here's Excellent. one, Sorry. but I don't think it's difficult. Is it difficult to change our billing software to account for all these nuances and different rates? And no, for the most part, the fixed fees are just a matter of going in and um, updating the schedule for FY17. The only thing that's going to take some time is the 80% um, percentage rate applied to the water consumption because that, that means that we have to go into each individual record. And we can only do that when we're starting to bill for FY17. So for sections one and two, we'll have to start before we load those into the active billing se section and change all of the factors to a 0.8 versus a 1%. Only 11,000 oh. records, right? Is that 11,000? And the two rates for res for the small users? Isn't so the, That's not a challenge. the billing system does allow us to put in a tiered system with oh. two different rate schedules oh, depending on the amount of consumption. So yeah, it's going to be relatively Oh, yeah, there are more tiers then. I have one question that's on the same lines. What would it take to go from quarterly to monthly? So we were just having that discussion, mm -hmm. and um, the water department is currently purchasing new software where they're going to be able to download the readings into a vehicle um, that can collect the meter readings as it drives around the city. Mm -hmm. And they said that as soon as that software is installed, they'll be able to go monthly immediately after that. The problem is the the paperwork aspect. Well, um, I was actually thinking that would be the harder part. And, right. And that, that would nailing. be where the cost would be, too. And we're going to have to look at that. Um, Chris was saying that eventually, what was it, Jim, that they're going to have some incentive systems that are based It on? sounds like uh, DEP is really pushing communities to go to, bill e to, to monthly, monthly billing yeah. um, because it just equates your bill with every other bill that you get on a monthly basis. Right. So your bill doesn't seem so large. And um, the way they're, so they're, they'll be encouraging public water suppliers to do that. And I think they can't mandate it, but what I was describing is the way sometimes the DEP will implement these policies is they'll, they'll tie them to grants or loans or some other thing. So if you're looking for some financial assistance from them, you know, one of the criteria may be, you know, do you do, you do monthly billing? If so, you get 10 extra points or whatever. So I think it'll be tied to incentives like that. But as a policy, um, DEP is really interested in having communities go monthly. Mm -hmm. We're also looking at upgrading our utility billing program to UBCIS. It's an upgrade in our system, um, which allows us to email the um, invoices in the future. So that would also cut down that would save on some money. Yeah, that would well, that's really, I guess, what the question is: is, is the burden, uh, is the burden to go monthly worth the cost to uh, implement? To what would be the advantage, I suppose? But there's clearly an advantage to. Um, people who don't garden in the summer, or people who do garden in the summer, I guess. I'm not See. sure. You could change rates in that regard. Right. Gives you the flexibility to do more. If DEP right. gave grants for very useful things, they would give it to communities to do monthly billing rather than something else entirely that, right. you know, you know what I mean. Right. The real meat and potatoes of life that we need. Anything else for Anne Marie? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for coming. Thanks, Anne Marie. All right, let's move on to the next item. It's um, the role of this commission, and it started with an email from Wendy. Um, but I suspect it's something that we've all been thinking about as we look back over the past year and and uh, our function and how it's changed from when we were aboard. So. Would you like to start since you I was actually this? going to start by saying what you're the folks who experienced that and the shift and how things have changed and how, as I said in a follow-up, you know how your expertise and knowledge and length of uh, 
and depth of understanding of, of this operation of this department, um, how can you be most useful and, not, and feel your time and your your effort is valued? And the only thought I had was that I read that the council is looking at having committees that bring on non-counselors to those committees, if that's a way to integrate more into the actual decision making, and not just advisory role. That's a lot. Yeah. We did. Yes. Yeah. That's why. I'm, oh, you used to. Wait. There used to be a joint committee with three from this Board right. of Public Works and three City Council. And and I think the potential for that is existing with this plan to this proposal. I'm not sure where that's at. I don't know if anybody knows more about that, you know, the council. Well, I had a, I had a brief okay. discussion with the mayor, and, and all I can tell you is that it's on his mind, and I think there will be a discussion with us and others in the city about how this commission fits in with the city council public works committee and, and what makes sense going forward, he's, which he's just not at a point where any thoughts have been developed. Yes. Well, in previous years, and I think you were part of it, I mean, I think it happened up until three years ago, we would meet during budget season and have tutorial sessions and talk about things and think about things like we don't want to go from a rate of $5 per cubic centimeter to $10 just like that. We want to make it, and we want to decide do we want to spend uh, money from the reserves, do we want to have it be all rate-based, we, and we were very thoughtful about this and we were thinking about the citizens of um, Northampton a lot. And so in some ways, okay, it's less time for us, but I, w I was happy to see in this particular study that a lot of the values that we spent thinking about in terms of the budget were taken into consideration. I was very impressed with, with uh, Woodcock. And, but I also was sort of excited by the fact that we could never have paid for that study. I mean, I don't think that our um, uh, sewer, I mean, our wood, I mean, our, our water uh, enterprise funds would have been able to afford that, whereas the city could, could pay for it. Mm -hmm. So being able to get very pointed um, results from this research seemed to be an advantage. I agree. I, um, I guess I have two observations. One is, in my career, I work. You, many of you have heard me say this. I work for a lot of communities in different forms of public works administration, um, and there are lots of forms that work. Yeah. So it, it doesn't. The one we have today can work. A change to this one can work. The old one worked. I mean, so they all can work. Um, and I've lost track of the other thought, so it may drift back. We'll see. I, also, I, I wanted to start out, I was contemplating what, what I might say, is to ask, you know, what value um, um, this committee in its current form has for you, or is it just another night out <laughs> at a work meeting? Um, you know, I don't want to put those, those kind of words into it. But um, I think that's the other piece of the puzzle is what, Okay. okay. And, and the other point, and it, it, it's obvious to all of us, that for quite a few months in a row, the only items on our agenda were updates. That, that we, except for a few things that were left over from when we were aboard, we, we really have no new assignments. And, and yet tonight, we have more substance in our meeting than we've had for quite a while, so mm -hmm. it's a little ironic that mm -hmm. <laughs> substance comes with this discussion. But. Um, I also think we ought to be, um, most of the people around this table are very busy and, and I think want to be here, but at least I want to be here if I'm doing something significant. Um, so I think as we go forward and have this discussion with the mayor, we need to work that into it somehow. So I want to go back, I don't know if you feel comfortable addressing that, but. Well, I guess. I have two observations. One is that the commission was established by the mayor, so what the commission does or doesn't do really has to do with what the mayor wants the commission to do or not do. Um, and my own my own feeling on it is that when there was a board, um, I always valued the fact that I had seven other very smart people in the room 
looking at everything that we were doing and providing good input in terms of the things that we were doing. And I, I, the way that I work, I do appreciate input and um, other opinions about the things that we do. So I always found the board meetings to be very useful and I always appreciated the thoughts that people brought in. Um, sometimes I was a little uncomfortable because questions would be asked and I wouldn't know the answers, but that's, I think that's the, the part of getting good input. And um, I think that that, I think there's a place for that for me as someone who manages things. That's just the way that I work. Even with the people within the department, employees, I like to get as much input as I can. When I have people, you know, like these around the table, it's like, yeah, you can get a lot of benefit from it. So. so you're saying it, it's still a benefit, even though the decision making and the authority is not, no longer rests with this board the way you do. Um, I don't know how much of a benefit it is. I mean, you tell me. I mean, it, it doesn't seem like. <laughs> well, you're, at, you're asking me, but you're not, I'm not getting a lot of input right now. I'm mm -hmm. communicating to you what we're doing. Right. I'm not bringing things in to you say, saying, we're thinking about doing this or that or the other mm -hmm. thing, or we have this contract coming up, or we have this RFP. We're not, we're, to, we're operating at a different level. Before it was, before we did anything. Right. Is everybody on board with what we're doing? Mm -hmm. And now it's more like, this is what we're doing. And now it's why did you do this? <laughs> we have, you know, now now we have. And I, I think it's clear that that the authority that was vested in the board went over to the mayor and the city council, mm -hmm. and so that's where the decisions get made. Now. And and you know, that was that was approved by the uh, proposed by the mayor and approved by the council. So um, it it would be odd to continue the old practice. Uh, on, you know, so I think Jim's right. If there's an issue that that the mayor, the council, wants us to deliberate on, then I think it will come to us. But other than that, um, at least so far for the past year, there's been no other work to do. Okay. So I, I this will I think this topic will get more attention in the near future. I can't, there's no timeline for it, but I think you were onto something that, and in my mind, I, I wanted to see how things went for a year. Um, I think it gives us all a chance to have a, a better discussion about our role when the time comes. Can I just ask, and you don't have to answer, but mm -hmm. I'll just throw out there my idea about, um, and can still keep going, mm -hmm. um, but also I, I would advocate for having your representation if the council goes in this direction uh, on those committees that, or committee that addresses public works issues that it actually, you know, draw upon this group. I was worried at the time that the change happened and reached out to my own counselor who I had not really met because I had known the previous one for many years and it was just natural to, to interact. And this was the, and my first concern was that she wouldn't run again, but she did run again. And my, my second concern was like, we don't have a rapport. So there isn't an official way to have a rapport. And so that's why the committee concept is good. But we had really, this core group had really put a lot of time into having certain values and, and we had wonderful, wonderful staff to, to agree with those values or there was some exchange there. So the, the issue is what will happen going forward because um, in a way we have history but there's also changes there, there's also changes in how city administration works so so i don't i'm just i mm -hmm. guess i'm just making a comment mm -hmm. sure. well we certainly don't have any pressure it's not like we can make a wrong decision <laughs> uh, we're not approving contracts and we're not disapproving contracts and that's what we did before so in a lot of ways we had more responsibility well, we did have more responsibility we had fiscal responsibility mm -hmm. um i think we all took it very seriously and mm -hmm. I, I feel like we did a pretty good job mm -hmm. I, I really don't know there's no other place to come i don't i don't know what they do in other communities they've um, increasingly so gone to this is a 
it came out of the study, the recommendation to do this, and they've increasingly moved in this direction. Yeah. Right. Where you don't have these unelected bodies that have It sort of makes sense. I think a lot of people, well, I know when we were setting rates, we were increasing water and sewer rates on a regular basis. I think we definitely were getting public mm -hmm. comment. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe we weren't doing a good enough job to say why we were increasing the rates, but we knew why we were increasing the rates, and it was for the benefit of the community. That was the only reason why. Um, and but there were a lot of things that we we had no control of. You know, there's the capital budget. We, we had we had oversight, but we didn't have any way to get more of it. Or you know, I mean, it was. Um, I think there was a lot of trust with what um, Jim and Ned were doing. And, um, I think we did the best we could. I think there were some things that, that happened in the last couple of years which were just great, and that was like the paving that happened this past year. I think mm -hmm. everyone noticed that. Mm -hmm. um, and that was and that was sort of planned in advance, and partly I think the mayor funded, dropped in a, an extra million dollars or something. I can't remember quite what happened mm -hmm. exactly. But yeah, the mayor's been very supportive of the paving program. Yeah. The half a million dollars a year, I think, for yeah. paving. So. And um, I think we had traditionally been asking for a lot more than what we would get. And um, that's politics. We had, to, we had to sort of navigate some pretty rough waters there, closing the landfill, which was really, mm -hmm. that was really that. tough. <laughs> it was really tough. Um, and I, in some ways, I'm relieved we don't have to do that stuff anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, now we have this private way issue again. It's going to be very stressful. <laughs> Um, but I, I hope, I mean, I, so for me personally, I just think city municipal infrastructure is just amazing stuff and um, it's just taken for granted. Mm -hmm. And uh, modern life wouldn't exist without it. And I, I'm concerned that we aren't going to be able to have it forever. You know, it's been only for a few hundred years. And what happens a hundred years from now, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, get your water out of your phone. Yeah, exactly. Somehow. <laughs> that would be an app. <laughs> I'm thirsty. That's what I'll have to get one of those. Jim Dawson was always, if I could just jump in, he was always going, we need to protect our water supply. We need to protect our water supply. And we did lots of research on it. We did lots of um, voting for, um, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure what will happen with that if that just is completely, if that's just informative, it's on the contract that we're spending this much money on increasing buying land to to protect our water supply but but I mean that was a that was a philosophical thrust that he had and he would push us toward uh, respecting and and um, and it was I mean thinking about that were critical aspects for our decision making that yeah. well, that actually, you hope that the mayor and you hope that the staff goes in that direction I think the staff is going in that direction, always has. I mean, I think mostly I've just agreed to whatever the staff has recommended mm -hmm. in, in ways, but once you understand why, yeah. it's pretty easy to say yes. Yeah. I was glad to see on the, the contracts uh, spreadsheet that you gave us that we're considering buying two more properties in the watershed. That's great stuff. I, yeah. I, I think we always want to see that happening because I, I uh, Land use, um, <clears throat> as the population grows, land use is going to be pressure, and um, the more we control for good, clean water, the better. Uh, seems like a lot of money when you look at individual lots, but when you think about the future um, and what would it cost clean water that you had to divert from a river, for instance, that caused some problems in your uh, Mm -hmm. Distribution system, which caused problems in your quality. Holy mackerel! Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what they're going to do. With. That's uh, you don't have to worry about that either. That's not on our agenda. No. Um, but that you start to realize the importance of that stuff when you look at what can go wrong. And it seems like it's just water. Anything else? I know. Well, this will be coming up again well, in the next few months. It, just, it sounds like. It's worth having this commission be at least an advisory board. It has a, it has a very important role to and, and to maybe increase 
I don't know what it is right now, but it's role in being sought for an opinion on things by the administration, by the council, the mayor's office. So, I leave it to you because I'm yeah. going to be leaving. <laughs> I won't be at the next meeting. I called today. I called today to say, oh, so is, when is my term up? And the clerk didn't know. I have my paper. It says March, but end of March, beginning of March. So the end yeah, of March. So the, I, I will be at the next meeting. meeting. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. I could do something fast and no. Unless there's another private way. Extra extra innings. Yeah, extra right. months. Over time. Uh, perhaps we can move on on the agenda. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Next item, Jim, is the contract update. I'm sorry, I have to excuse myself. Oh, sure. So good night. I'll see you next month. Next month. You're going in the fall? No. Tonight? No, not tonight. <laughs> not tonight. <laughs> oh, can I just ask a question under old business? Sure. The, the, we, a few meetings I was at, we talked about the struggles you've been having with FEMA and the dam and all of that. Just, just sort of, were you going to say anything about that tonight? Or do you have an update on that? Or? Um. Yes, yeah, sure. I think we'd like to A quick one, since I'm going. <laughs> sure. Okay. Yeah, we had um, a significant list of comments regarding um, from FEMA regarding the benefit cost analysis that was done, and we worked with BZA to pretty much revamp an approach on doing that BCA analysis, and um, we submitted it to them back to NEMA and FEMA about a week ago. Okay. So we're waiting to hear back. Good things out. Right. Okay. So I'm glad I asked that. Yeah. <laughs> so the contracts? Contracts. So we'll go through this list of uh, recent contracts that we've signed. The first one um, is a contract with tie and bond for $8,400 um, to do a chemical accident prevention um, plan at the wastewater plant. This is Sort of a regulatory obligation regarding um, the use of chlorine gas as a disinfectant. So it was a, a plan that needed to be updated um, to satisfy EPA. The next contract is with GZA Geo Environmental for $20,250 related to the Upper Roberts Mineral Dam removal. It's actually that's actually the money that we needed to have GZA respond to FEMA comments and revise the analysis and that sort of thing. So um, that has moved ahead um, satisfactorily so far. Um, the next two items are for the purchase of um, property um, in the watershed. It's the watershed of the Mountain Street Reservoir. Um, two parcels, um, uh, $90,000 a piece for each. We have a pending uh, grant with the state to pay for these, mm -hmm. and we're waiting to hear from the state on it. Um, we're looking to probably close um, by the end of the fiscal year on those. Either way, whether we get the grant or not. Uh, the next uh, contract is just a time extension contract with Kleinfelder on the industrial park interceptor replacement design. Um, that project is uh, construction is complete. Kleinfeld is just wrapping up um, record plans for us, so we're going to be getting another bill or two from them. So we need to extend the time so we can pay those bills. Um, the next contract is with Mountain View Landscapes at Pulaski Park. Uh, change order number three for $1,300 is um, related to some concrete work um, adjacent to the Academy of Music. Um, between the park and the academy in a sidewalk transition that required some special work to make that all kind of come together in a nice way. Um, next, uh, the next one is a time extension with Cotton Tree Services for their work that they're doing um, for red pine removal. It, it says stands 21 and 25. This is in, in the Roberts Meadow watershed area along Reservoir Road. Uh, next contract is with Amp Electrical at the wastewater treatment plant to do some um, electrical upgrades in the basement of the control room where we have some problems with the electrical system there. Um, the Audubon Road reconstruction design is the next contract with Time Bond for $126,750. Um, 
That's a streets design project that involves replacement of a water transmission main, um, new drainage system, and coming up with um, a pave, new pavement um, for a section of road uh, along Audubon Road. Um, the next three contracts were uh, vehicle purchases. We purchased five uh, Ford 350s, uh, three Ford 550s, and two Ford Transit vans under a uh, state contract with MHQ. So we've had a, um, money in the in the budget to uh, do vehicle replacement. So we're trying to catch up on some of those. Um, the next contract is for the 140-ton uh, iron worker. Um, which is a piece of equipment I'm assuming they use in the mechanics bay. And but you never gave it's you just one, rid of? one really big guy. Well, that's what I thought it was. <laughs> yeah. That's what I thought it was, and I asked Richie for information. But I, didn't, I didn't get an update, but I'm, I'm assuming it's something that we need. <laughs> um, <laughs> the next contract is a design contract with Kleinfelder for Hinckley Street reconstruction geotechnical engineering. Um, when we went through the permitting process with the um, Conservation Commission, one of the, we have a very steep slope at the outfall design for that, and we had proposed riprap stabilization. It's about a one and a half to one slope, so very steep. Um, they didn't really like the riprap um, solution to stabilizing that, so they wanted to see some sort of green treatment for it, and that pretty much gets out of our ability to do a design like that, so we had to hire a consultant to help us with it. Um, it gets pretty difficult. Um, that outfall is in a very tight location. There's a lot of resource areas, so our ability to move slopes and make things less steep um, is limited by the location of wetlands. So there's a lot of sort of geometry problems out there <laughs> to work with. Um, so we had to call in someone that knew a little bit of the more geotechnical engineering than we know. And that's what that is. Um, the next contract is a change order one with Bob Nelstrom for Bliss Street Water Main Replacement Resident Inspection Services. Um, that project was this um, water main replacement on Bliss Street. It's been because of the weather. It's been moving a little slower than your sort of normal water main replacement project in the construction duration we had estimated for Bob's contract wasn't long enough, so this just allows him to continue to provide um, inspection services for us while that job gets wrapped up. And then the last contract is with CDM Smith, $11,700 to do an abbreviated no notice of resource area delineation for the King Street Brook. So they did a very uh, comprehensive hydraulic model for us under another contract. Um, for the King Street Brook and the Barrett Street Marsh, basically from the bike path all the way up to the Connecticut River. A really nice model, we were really happy with it, but um, part of that project involved delineating um, the wetland resource areas around the Barrett Street Marsh by the King Street Brook culvert. So a lot of work went into delineating these resources and the idea of the ANRAD is to get those approved by the Commission so that they're locked in place for three years and that will give us time we had applied for FEMA grant money to do design and construction of a, um, a flood control um, berm there. So we're just trying to get a few things solidified with the commission while we wait for the money. We're still proceeding with the berm? Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And this, this is between the rail trail and Prospect Street? That's, King, that's where King Street Brook is? Through there? The one that would flood and right. go down to Church Street. Right. So the, the berm is going to be between where the culvert is and where State and Started Street meet at the end by the bike path. So we'll be in there. So if the marsh overflows, it doesn't go down to Church Street. Right. Or is it, is it, where is the berm located? Up by the brook or further down? Um, it's a little closer to where state and started me. Yeah. The idea is that with the berm the water level will rise higher before flooding and going up down a church street. Right. Mm -hmm. So it put more pressure on the box culvert? It does. It puts more it gives you more hydraulic head to move yeah. more water through the box culvert. Yeah. So it's sort of a inexpensive 
um, way of reducing the likelihood of flooding there. But it actually does encourage flooding in the marsh area. It does. Yeah. It, it, it wants to divert the water the way we want it to go, not the way the rain wants it to go. Right, but what I, what, what I like about it is that it, it actually allows some, for some flooding. It gives you some storage, right. which builds head, keeps it out of the neighborhood, mm -hmm. um, but lets it go where it would want to go otherwise. In other words, it's different than just putting a levee along the brook. Right. Are, are we purchasing land from the property owners? We will have to. Oh, is this entirely on the bike path? Probably? No. Well, the, there'll be impacts on private property, so at a minimum we, we'd need a drainage easement to do the things that, uh -huh. that we're talking about. Right. I see. Things, a few things on your plate. That's a couple. Any other questions? Move on to uh, updating our compost. <laughs> you know, I put hate to have up. compost that's out of date. I'm embarrassed to say I need to table our compost discussion because I put it on the agenda and then failed to fully brief myself before this evening's meeting to let you know. Good compost takes time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I had, exactly. Uh, I it's had, still Does it, it have to still do with the solid waste enterprise fund? No. It's um, a long time ago. Someone may even remember asking me a question about food waste composting and, and, and the status of the program and what the trends have been in terms of diversion and collection. Um, so Susan uh, did crunch some numbers and provided uh, a spreadsheet and some graphs to Dave Valletta, but I haven't looked at them. So I can't really give you anything meaningful. Other than anecdotally, if you talk to the gatekeepers, they'll tell you that we're seeing more food waste diversion than we've ever seen. So it just seems like the program has been really successful. So. You did it. <laughs> Last item on the agenda. Maybe that's all you need. <laughs> <laughs> See, if you told us that was the extent of the update, we would have been happy. <laughs> yes. I guess I shouldn't, we be, are happy. I shouldn't beat up on myself. I'll put it on the next agenda for you. you. I can't wait to hear the rest of the story. I'm an engineer. I feel like I'm failing if I don't have a chart or yeah, yeah. a table. <laughs> oh, there's a board right here. You can do one. Mm -hmm. And it goes like we could draw a pile. The anecdotal right. thing is going up. It goes like that. Yeah. How um, about an update on the Bridge Street Cemetery? So we received a draft preservation plan from Martha Lyon, the landscape architect that's helping us with the project. Um, that was posted online uh, this week and tomorrow evening from 7 to 8.30. Um, we have a public forum. It will be the last public forum for the Bridge Street Cemetery. This will be held at the Senior Center um, where Martha will present information about um, preliminary recommendations that are contained within the plan and seeking to get input um, from folks that come out to the meeting. Um, it's been a really it's been a really nice project. Martha has done a, a really phenomenal job and we had a nice committee that um, Roe has participated in and helped a lot with. So. It's a really good project that's sort of on the way of, um, we're just trying to wrap it up now. And um, This plan is, it's like some of the other plans that we do where it outlines priorities for projects and funding needs to make improvements similar to the water or the wastewater plan. And it's really a great thing. The, the Bridge Street Cemetery, I think, is a wonderful historic resource for the city. And Martha has a lot of uh, great ideas, I think, to make that better. So um, tomorrow night from 7 to 8.30, we'll be talking about the plan. Somebody from the cemetery. Yeah. <laughs> Call from beyond. Yay. Yes. Please come to the meeting. So. Um, that completes the agenda. Gary, do you have anything else? Maybe. Jim, do you have anything else? No. DJ? David? Any news on the director selection? I know, I'm sure it's early in the process. But. So I am on the screening committee, and we've been sworn to secrecy. Um, but application period has ended, and the screening committee met this week, and we're reviewing the applications. Are you happy? I'm generally happy. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for checking in on me. How many people are on the committee? 
I don't know if that's a secret or not. There are five of us. There are five of us. Is anything happens maybe to Jim on the Matrix program? Which was something we Matrix proved study. four months ago? I, I think he understands the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, the matrix study has been delivered to the mayor's office, um, and I have seen the study. He provided a copy uh, for me to take a look at. Um, I think he's waiting um, to consider the contents of the study until we have a new director in place. Well, that certainly makes sense. I think it does. Have you seen it? I have, mm -hmm. and he's he's not made it public. How is it not public? So we're public. Well, but I mean, I don't, I don't see how it's not public. He's a friend. <laughs> Can I ask a, 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 a also a question? I mean, it's like. It's completely done, or it's been given to you to make comments on it and put it back to him? Oh, that's not clear to me. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, well, it he, might he go back to him, but it, it, is it done from the study? You know, yeah. do they get yeah. a preliminary I'm draft saying, if comments, if it, right? If it, if it, right. That, and that might be why. Right. Yeah, if the, the consultants have concluded their work. Yeah, so that would make sense. Would make sense I would love to see it. I think it would be well, good yeah. for this committee to see it. Yeah. Anything else? No. Motion to adjourn? <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned.